This is Arkansas 11, KTHV Little Rock. Nathaniel Haggard is no ordinary student. He's been picked to attend the People to People Science School in Australia this summer. The $5,000 trip seems next to impossible, but Nathaniel's determined to fulfill his dream. I'm not afraid to go to Australia. I, I'd love to get out of America for once because it's, it's basically an everyday thing here. Uh, I like to be able to wake up in a totally new different place. Nathaniel has begun selling pizzas and raking yards to come up with the money he needs and his principal sees a lot of potential in the aspiring archaeologist. I think it's a tribute to Arkansas education and of course to education in North Little Rock and Ridge Road that Nathaniel have the opportunity to go. Nathan. Miriam Haggard has rented a booth at the neighborhood flea market to help pay for her son's trip. Come on. The single mother sells everything from old clothes to dishes because she doesn't want any free handouts. I'm not a I'm not a type of person that likes for my kids to have, I mean I want my kids to have material things but I'd rather have opportunities come their way because I feel like that would benefit them in the future more so than material things. And for now Nathaniel doesn't need material things, just a chance to explore a country his young eyes have never seen. I'm working real hard for this and uh, it's basically not an easy thing and that uh, I really, 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 really want to go. <laughs> Think of Chenal Valley and million dollar homes with a panoramic view of a world class golf course come to mind. Most of those were bought by individuals to build custom homes, so there wasn't a lot of uh, speculative construction in Chenal Circle. Now even more builders are at work. Trees will be cleared to make way for three new Chenal neighborhoods, but with a change, homes to suit different budgets. We'll be reaching the largest uh, segment of the market here in Chenal, so we, we're getting close to having uh, products available for just about everyone. This site will become Aberdeen Court, what developers are calling the new, more affordable housing. But the word affordable is used in the Chenal Valley sense, in that lots here will start at about $30,000, and homes will range in price from $150,000 to almost a quarter of a million dollars. The other two new neighborhoods will be modeled after the lush homes on Chenal Circle and Duclair Court. Our second uh, uh, neighborhood that we're going to offer is a garden home neighborhood called Avignon Court, and those lots will start in the 60s, so that's a, an upscale neighborhood. And the third one is our luxury uh, offering for 1993 called Bretonnet Court. The seven-figure expansion is appealing to local contractors who are capitalizing on Little Rock's westward moving trend. Before it's been kind of a high-end thing, and now we're going we're gonna to cover all spectrums, and uh, which is real exciting. We'll get a, a lot more people out here, and the town's growing here, and it's beautiful. The new lots are already being marketed. Chanel officials say home building will begin later this year. Now that the jury in the Rodney King case has spoken, Americans are speaking up for renewal, togetherness, and peace. Surely the lasting legacy of the Rodney King trial ought to be that, a determination to reaffirm our common humanity and to make a strength of our diversity. And if we can do that, then we can get on about the business of this great land. There's a sense of relief that enough justice has been meted out for most people now to move toward an agenda that is positive and hopeful and not one that is more uh, full of hostility and anger. Attorney General Janet Reno pledged her department will continue to ensure civil rights for all. I want to join with citizens, with local officials, with people who care, and with the hundreds and thousands of sensitive, caring police officers around this nation. Here at home, word of the decision did not travel as fast, but it still brought the same response. Can we get your comments on the uh, Rodney King verdicts this morning? This, maybe this I've not heard it. What was it? They convicted Officer Powell and Coon, and the other two they found not guilty. I did not know that. All I can do is hope and pray that we don't have a repeat of what we had in 1991. Little Rock police officers would not comment on camera about the matter. Off camera, some just said they were glad it's over. And that seems to be the viewpoint of the public as well. Well, you think it's over now? Oh, yes. I think justice will serve. I think that was the right verdict.
This plane is a Hawkeye, named for its radar that can look hundreds of miles in any direction. Its mission is to monitor the skies around the USS John F. Kennedy Battle Group. As part of Operation Provide Promise, it gathers information critical to the Bosnian relief effort. Eric Agee of Conway is an air traffic controller on the massive ship. He spends his days communicating with pilots. We tell them certain altitudes to take and which way to turn. We tell them, we give them traffic, which is like airplanes coming together. We make sure they don't hit each other. And we just send them on their mission. The carrier is nicknamed Big John. It's a floating city with its own airport. As many as 120 planes take off and land every day. It's a hotel with 5,000 beds, a restaurant that serves 15,000 meals a day. It has its own TV station and newspaper, but in some ways, being an air traffic controller here is like landing planes on asphalt. I mean, like at night, if they can't see each other, they depend on us for courses and other airplanes to make sure we don't hit them. And like when it's real bad weather out, that's when they really depend on us to make sure we get them to the ship on time. Eric Agee appreciates the contribution he is making to the relief effort in Bosnia, but while helping those people, he misses the people he loves. I miss my wife <laughs> being out here so long, and my family. The Kennedy is based in Norfolk, Virginia. This fall, the massive ship will go to dry dock in Philadelphia for a scheduled overhaul. It was called the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. In its isolated North Arkansas compound, the CSA formulated a doctrine mixing religion, white supremacy, and survivalism. At first, members kept to themselves, but a huge stash of weapons and explosives accumulated, and group members were connected to attempted bombings, robberies, and murders. When federal agents tried to serve arrest warrants, it sparked a four-day standoff. No shots were fired and no one was hurt or killed in, in the CSA incident, which was... Uh, it was all done through negotiations, which was the, uh, you know, you can ask for more than that, really. Usually what we know is that it's not so much the beliefs within cults that attract individuals, but that individuals aren't, aren't really, say, fervently adhering to a set of beliefs that their parents or somebody else believed in. They may be looking for something. Richard says cult leaders typically have very charismatic personalities, like fallen televangelist Tony Alamo. They're able to find people and make them recruits through friendship and high-pressure persuasion. From that point, the individuals use similar tactics to convince followers of just about anything. It's not unusual in a society that that has access to high quantities of guns and caches of, of uh, weaponry and that to ultimately wed this together with uh, religious beliefs to justify whatever action they want. Cults are often made up of younger people searching their souls and Richard says it's very common to find cult recruits coming from organized and accepted churches that don't offer the same fellowship of smaller fundamentalist congregations. We do see is that there's a, a usually a transformation for cults to be successful Normally they have to go through a process of, of a wide-scale recruitment and in many cases they begin to uh, lessen the differences between themselves and mainstream religion. When cults don't change their beliefs, it can spell their doom. Sharon Henson is moving in with her dart gun, ready to use a tranquilizer to catch a stray dog. She's got it. She's got it. Sharon and Carrie Tipton are working together on this day, a day that includes looking for a pack of stray dogs under an abandoned home, chasing dogs that are on the move, and of course, catching dogs with a net and with the dart gun. I caught her on the run. She didn't know which way to go. Oh, yeah, so she was like... And then she turned around and started trying, and it was like, pfft, perfect shot. In some Little Rock neighborhoods, most dogs have never been registered, and most have never been to the vet. When these dogs get loose, they become wild, and they become dangerous. 
When you have free roaming dogs like we have, and you have one, you have chain link fences like this, your dog's not even protected. Vaccinations are not a 100% guarantee your dog can't catch the disease. So for all these strays that wander around, they can be carrying diseases passing on to responsible pet owners that are trying to take care of their animal, keep it confined, keep it under vaccination. And people that do not do this are contributing to the animal problem in Little Rock. Toward the end of her workday, Sharon grabs a chow mix that's wearing what used to be a dog collar. The collar was never loosened, and it grew into the animal's neck. Feel. Oh, God. That's what I grabbed a hold of. It's not a collar. I don't maybe, know what it is. Well, maybe an old, like, in a chain. No. Okay, oh, easy, easy. Shut the door. Ready? Easy. Go! In most cases, when Sharon and Carrie find a dog running free, no one wants to claim ownership. No one wants to pay as much as $60 to get the dog out of the pound. You got a driver's license? Do I? Yeah. Uh, you got a social security card? That's not my dog. I'm not the owner. Again. So who's the owner? Who's the owner? The yeah. owner is not here. Where is she? The owner does not stay here. At the end of the shift, the dogs in the cage have five days to live if no one adopts them and no one claims ownership. Your bobcats and stuff like that, we call it, uh, Jeff Wilkerson is on the road, coordinating Little Rock's animal control operation. What's your 20? 51 Saxony Circle. 10-4. That's out southwest. On this day, Jeff and his SCAT team have been called to a home behind the Little Rock Airport. SCAT stands for a Special Capture and Tactics Unit. Not all of the situations these people handle involve chasing dogs. This is a situation where a woman with a yard full of dogs has called animal control. She wants to give up some of her puppies. And them little ones, yana, they always are ready to give away when they come get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you gonna keep this one? Yeah. Is that male or female? That's a boy. That's a Jeff Wilkerson is very aware that when the public sees his staff handling a yard full of unregistered dogs like this, they think the control officers are the bad guys. But people don't see how the animals are living. We're the bad guy because we mess with these poor, helpless animals. And, uh, and I went to a restaurant once and some lady said exactly that to me. You know, leave the poor animals alone. I said, let's talk about the poor animal. The poor animals that run loose that you don't see, the common person doesn't see, is they get hit by cars. They hide and live underneath abandoned homes that you may never see them except at night. Then they uh, scrounge through trash to try to feed themselves. They catch disease and die very slow deaths because no one's giving them any type of care. Carrie Tipton is one of the team members handling this call. She's been working with pets and people for eight years. Very interesting. You get to meet a lot of nice people, meet a lot of nice dogs, too, and different kinds of animals. What's the strangest thing that's happened to you? I had a bear in Pleasant Valley one time. What was the bear doing? It was a pet. They had to remove it in the city because they're not allowed. <laughs> so they called animal control for the bear. Right. These scenes can be difficult to watch. That's why people who do this for a living want you to register your pets, get them good medical care, feed them properly, confine them to a safe place, and of course, neuter them to avoid unwanted litters. For the accused kidnapper and his victim, the ordeal that began in February ended at the Faulkner County Courthouse today, where potential jurors waited for selection. We had uh, 22 witnesses that were woodshedded, subpoenaed, uh, had been interviewed and were ready to testify. But they never got the chance. 40-year-old James Slack pleaded guilty to two charges of kidnapping, burglary, theft, terroristic threatening, and felony firearm possession. Once the discovery process is complete, then you can intelligently advise your client of his options. Slack admitted he broke into Alex Liblong's Conway home, kidnapped his wife Joanne, and demanded a million dollars in ransom before setting her free and turning himself in. Joanne Liblong says she's glad there will be no trial. Just having to relive the whole thing. Slack also pleaded guilty to another kidnapping incident in Lincoln County in January. When you look at the truth of the matter, James was obviously willing to, to be contrite 
to to accept his responsibility for that at the same time as accepting his responsibility for the leave law matter. Slack is due to be sentenced on May 10th. The plea bargain means he can't appeal whatever sentence is handed down. The state is pushing for 90 years. If Slack serves that concurrently, he could be eligible for parole in 13 to 19 years. No, I wouldn't be satisfied as a citizen of the state of Arkansas as if, if, if he were paroled out in 10 years. I can say that. But um, in terms of an official position of the prosecutor's office, that's, that's up to the court and it's up to the parole board. Alex Liblong was rumored to be against a plea bargain for fear his wife's kidnapper would get a lighter sentence. In the meantime, we plea bargain away and let these guys just go in and out. And it's about time somebody stand up and say I'm tired of the crime. The Liblongs say they've increased security at their ranch and hope to be able to resume a normal life. It's a start. But it's nobody, nobody wins in this deal. I'm going to say that too. I'm not a winner in the deal by any stretch. And, the, and he's not a winner either. Our state has an obligation as an employer and also because we are responsible for the public health to stimulate business and community involvement in understanding HIV and AIDS related issues and how to respond to them. Governor Tucker took a bold step to the forefront in helping address the issue of AIDS in the workplace. He's making sure businesses respond to the need of implementing HIV and AIDS policies across the state. But that's a task faced reluctantly by employers. One of the things this disease that we have to confront is, is, is fear. People don't understand it. It is, it is transmitted in a way that uh, of sex that that really makes people nervous. Judge Veline says the thing that should make people even more nervous are the startling statistics in our state. Arkansas is ranked 15th in the country for reported HIV and AIDS cases. More than 2,000 people in the state have become infected with the HIV virus. 73 out of 75 counties have reported cases of HIV and AIDS, and minorities make up 35% of the state's infections. Key leaders think this type of conference is essential for the future of America. Compassion is one thing, but we also need action. We need to provide individuals who have the disease with appropriate health care and benefits if they're working. If they're not working, we have to take care of them regardless. Governor Tucker and his staff see this conference as a first phase to tackling the deadly disease because providing information for employees and their bosses could be the difference between life and death. For 34 years, the State Chamber of Commerce has been holding an annual meeting in Washington, but never with an Arkansan in the White House. The Clinton presidency has been embraced by the state business community. Karen, do you sense that it's, it's helped the business climate in Little Rock? Without question, not only the business climate, but the image of Arkansas and the city of Little Rock. Wherever you go these days, people are aware of Arkansas and they're aware of Little Rock and the good things that have come to our state and our city as a result of President Clinton's election. Senator Dale Bumpers has seen administrations come and go here. He says it's still a little early for Arkansas to gauge the economic impact of Bill Clinton's election. He's certainly getting mixed reviews in the first hundred days. Is, you think that's true of all presidents? We just forget what's gone on with previous presidents? It is. You know, it's, it's not even a bump in the road, as Bob Dole called it. People have a tendency to want to embellish and exaggerate uh, every president's first hundred days. The truth of the matter is, the tough work is still ahead of us, and that's getting the deficit down. One of the state's three freshman faces in Congress also gives the administration enthusiastic reviews. Blanche Lambert came here in part on Bill Clinton's coattails. President Clinton, I feel like he's doing a fine job. He really is. He's working hard. He's showing both the Congress, I think, and the American people that he's dedicated to getting things done. And uh, he's working hard to negotiate what he needs to negotiate. And he's working hard to make sure that there's some results out there. And I think that's what people really want to see. As the first 100 days of the Clinton presidency comes to an end, national political pundits may not be giving rave reviews, but Arkansas political insiders are. I believe right today, everybody around this world knows where Arkansas is. And I've run into people in Arkansas that uh, have never had the opportunity to be in this position to help us bring industry to our state and to help us get more jobs and new opportunities. And I think it's going to turn things around for us. From the time he first shook John Kennedy's hand on the White House lawn, Bill Clinton has very much been a student of presidential history. He knows what has worked and what has failed for his predecessors in the Oval Office. 
Now with his own first 100 days coming to an end, he'll try to take those lessons from the past and keep his own administration on track. Joe Quinn, 11 Action News, Washington. It's a rare opportunity to walk back in time. A stroll through Little Rock's Mount Holly Cemetery is an Arkansas history lesson dating back to 1843. It's a wonderful way to learn about Little Rock and Arkansas history because all of the people that were so important in its inception of the state are, are here. Ten Arkansas governors are here, 13 men who sat on the state Supreme Court, five Confederate generals and 21 Little Rock mayors were buried here. Some of the headstones are elaborate, shipped from Italy at the turn of the century. Others are simple, but on all, the use of language is fascinating. Well, I, I don't know how to explain that. They, they just like to use high-flown language. For instance, there's a boy over there, 17 years old, who was shot in a hunting accident. And instead of saying that, it says, he was instantly deprived of life by the discharge of a gun. You know, just... But the word died was left out. That's right. It, it just softened the blow, I guess. The cemetery is owned by the city, but since the early 1950s, a cemetery association composed of 17 women has maintained this special place. Most of the women can come here and trace their family roots. My husband's uh, parents are buried here. He is his, in the newer part of the cemetery, uh, Judge Pat Mahaffey, who was on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Hundreds of men killed in the Civil War were buried here, but were later moved to the National Cemetery in Little Rock. Since 1843, a number of other people have also been laid to rest here, and then later, for different reasons, moved elsewhere. A section was set aside for Catholic burials, one for Jewish burials, and one for black burials. And of course, uh, when the Catholics started their own cemetery in the 1870s, that's Calvary, Many of those families moved their loved ones out there. It sits in the shadow of skyscrapers, but it's a throwback to the days when horses, not hearses, brought the remains to the burial. The Mount Holly Cemetery in Little Rock is a wonderful history lesson. My first governor is buried down at Walnut Hill, down in uh, the southwest corner of the state where he had a plantation. This is his brother, Elias Nelson Conway, who is the fifth governor. These women are on the cemetery association that maintains the grounds. Peg Smith is the unofficial historian. She knows where the misspellings on the headstones are. She can show you the young men who both died the same day at the Battle of Atlanta during the Civil War and were later buried side by side. Peg Smith understands this is a special place. It's so Victorian. It's a, truly a Victorian cemetery. All this uh, art and all of these sentimental sayings and are not what you see in the new things. For one thing, the, the newer cemeteries don't allow you to erect upright monuments. Each person buried here has a story. Each story is a tiny piece of American history, such as the tale of one of the first Little Rock firefighters killed in the line of duty. He fell off the front of the wagon as they were going around a curve and the back wheels ran over him. And even though they were, had been great rivals, the other volunteer fire departments all chipped in and bought this monument for him. Peg can also tell you about the Pulitzer Prize winner who is buried here. Uh, a laurel wreath is uh, an award for victory or honor. The laureate, you know, a poet laureate. But he won the Pulitzer Prize. And this is his wife, Charlie Mae Fletcher, who wrote under the name of Charlie May Simon. Like Peg Smith, Carolyn Coleman is on the Cemetery Association. She understands why this city-owned cemetery has been placed on the National Register of Historic Places. We have some, some uh, monuments here in the cemetery that are uh, just unique to anywhere. People that are into that type of thing come down here and just look at the cemetery just to see the, the uh, statuary. There are nine men buried here for whom Arkansas counties are named. Over there is the founder of the Arkansas Gazette. Also here, David Dodd, the so-called boy martyr of the Civil War. You can stand here, close your eyes, and almost see what life was like in Little Rock more than 100 years ago. Joe Quinn, 11 Action News, Little Rock.